Good to be with you again. I'm really excited about our topic in these weeks, this idea of let's pray. Uh, we've been working on this in our congregation here, and thousands of us have found that we can integrate prayer into our daily lives in a meaningful way. Not in an obtrusive way or a time-consuming way, but a, a single sentence will make a difference in God's involvement with us and the people around us. Uh, the biggest hurdle when we talk about prayer is, is the reality most of us just don't. You know, we, we kind of leave it. It's kind of like the nuclear option. If, if all else fails, pray. Well, I want to suggest a different approach. Let's pray before anything else. Let's let prayer become a part of our lives, an integral part of how we interact with people and how we talk to them. And so that when they think of us, they'll imagine us to be a person who would pray with them if the opportunity presented. You can do this. I promise you. I have done this with many, many people and I've seen the outcomes in hundreds of lives. God is anxious to be involved with you and with me. And if we'll just open our hearts to him in the slightest space, God will help us in ways we can't imagine. Enjoy the lesson. He said, I tell you the truth, unless you change and become like little children, you'll never enter the kingdom of heaven. Therefore, whoever humbles himself like this child is the greatest in the kingdom of heaven. Jesus used the child as the doorway to significance in the kingdom of God. I want to use that image with you for just a minute, if you'll allow me, because I think it opens many things to us about understanding what we can become in the kingdom of God. Jesus, he's speaking to his disciples on this day. He's not speaking to a group of rebellious, ungodly, stubborn, recalcitrant people. He's talking to the people who've already left to follow him. They're all in. And their question is, all right, how, does, how do we achieve significance in your kingdom? And he said, I'll show you, but it's going to require you to change. So the fact that you're all in is not enough. The fact that you've chosen to follow me, to be publicly identified with me is not enough. He said, it's, it's a lifelong expression. It's not a singular event. It's not just one decision. He said, unless you change to become more childlike, and you can model the humble learning characteristics of a child. Now, please note he didn't say to be childish. We got enough childish folks, don't we? We don't need any more of that. But he said there's a value to a childlike characteristics. One of the things I love about children and kids is their, is their capacity to learn. They are hungry learners, aren't they? They will wear you out with why. All right? And you, you, you can use big words and they'll just keep saying why. They want to know everything. How's it work? Let me do it. Why? God, make them stop. <laughs> there, there's, a, there's some descriptive terms that are used often with the way we learn. Uh, native and immigrant. I see them most frequently used in terms of technology. And I'm not using them in the context of international migration and people moving from one place to another, but simply as terms that are descriptive of how we learn. That we're either, when it comes to an idea or a set of ideas, that we're either native to those ideas or we're immigrants with respect to those ideas. It's used most frequently when I see it with technology. That all the kids that were on the stage a few minutes ago, they are native to the technological digital world. It's normal to them. They've never lived. The, the, those crew that was up here just a second ago, weren't they amazing? Wow. They're, they're digital natives. They have never lived in a world without an iPhone. <laughs> they cannot imagine life without a smartphone. See, I try to imagine life without one. <laughs> but it's as normal to them and as they, they, now they have no imagination of a television set that requires you to walk across the room to change the channel. <laughs> you can use it in other contexts, language. You, you're, you're born with a language, it's the language you're native. I'm a native English speaker. Now I've learned some other languages in academic settings, but I would stress the academic part of that. You would not want to depend upon me to do any high-level negotiations for you in a language other than Southern. Because <laughs> I might get every fourth word, but that's not really great help if you're negotiating something of any significance. Uh, in, I, I studied Hebrew at Hebrew University in Jerusalem. Hebrew is an ancient language. It has a completely different alphabet, so you, it means you can't guess at words. And the, the, the alpha, it's, 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 it uses different sounds, consonant sounds. One of the Hebrew letters is chet, C-H-E-T, if you write it out in English. But that's not how it sounds when they pronounce it. 
It's pronounced like chet. Well, in the South, if I walk up and go ch, that's not a letter, that's a warning. Then I wasn't sure they were telling me the truth in class when they were trying to get me to say you know, I used to get whipped for that back home. And it was not a native language to me. I was very much an immigrant. You know, we read from left to right. Hebrew is just the opposite. You read from right to left, which means we all understand this is the front of the book for us. But in Hebrew, this is the front of the book. That will mess you over <laughs> if you come to it later in life. Now, you can take children and put, I have friends who have children and the parents come from two different places. They speak different languages. Is their native tongue? And so the father speaks to the children in one language and the mother speaks to the children in another language and they got three-year-olds that are bilingual. Y'all act like that's normal. I'm still working on English. Those little fellows are amazing learners. So when Jesus brings a little child and says, unless you change, they're already devoutly religious. They're already following him. They've already been willing to publicly align themselves with him. He says, unless you have the humility of a child and the hunger to understand the kingdom of God, significance in that kingdom will never come to you. I want to suggest to you that this whole prayer initiative has a great deal to do with humility and a willingness to learn. And at least in passing, I want to suggest you have a tremendous opportunity if you still have children at home. You have an opportunity for, for faith and spiritual things to become as, as much a part of their life as anything else that they learn from the earliest days of their memory. We want them to be native people of faith. We want prayer to be as normal to them as chicken nuggets. We want spiritual things to be as familiar to them as Rocky Top. Let the children in your sphere of influence know that there is a God, that Jesus is his son, that the Bible is true and trustworthy, and that God is worthy of respect and his people are worthy of respect. Let the children around you, in whatever nature those relationships come, let them see you as a person that they look up to, a person of influence, let them know there's really two, two layers to our agenda this year with Let's Pray. One is we, tr we wanna make prayer a more common part of our everyday life. We wanna introduce prayer to a, in a broader, more friendly, more normative way to the expression of life as we live in community. But we don't wanna stop with that. We recognize that there's much about prayer that we don't know. And we're asking God to help us become a people who learn to pray. We've been asking that for a while. We've gained a little traction in that. We pray together with some routine now. We pray out loud without embarrassment. You pray for one another. We, there's, a, there's a momentum in prayer around us. But we recognize we have a lot to learn. We're back to Jesus' image of the child. And unless we humble ourselves and become like little children with a hunger to learn, we will never find significance in the kingdom of God. And so one of the things we're going to do throughout this year is keep drilling down a little bit on this notion of prayer. And I want to do that in a kind of an introductory way this morning, I suppose. And it's with a simple idea, but it's fundamental to the story, and it's that spiritual matters matter. Spiritual matters matter. Spiritual things make a difference. You know, we live in a post-enlightenment Western world where there's an emphasis on the rational, and that, I'm pretty much at home in that world. I like both sides of the equation to balance, and if we're making a trip, I want to know the plan. But the reality is spiritual things are as real as the physical world in which we live. John 4 and verse 24 says, God is a spirit, and his worshipers must worship him in spirit and in truth. In fact, the Bible tells us from the introduction in the Bible, in Genesis chapter 1, it says that the Spirit of God hovered over the face of the earth, and God spoke our, the order into our world. The whole creation narrative is about God, a spirit, bringing order to the chaos that was present on planet Earth. So the spiritual gave rise to the physical. Spiritual things aren't fuzzy, indistinct. They're not the, the stuff of your imagination. 
They are real. Now, again, we, most of us come to that with, with behind the learning curve, so it feels a little awkward. And one of the things I've been telling you repeatedly about prayer is that there's a workmanlike quality to prayer. A workmanlike quality. It means you show up every day and you do your part. It means you go when you don't feel like it and you do when you do. It means you may interact with people that you wouldn't normally interact with, but that's work. It means you're responsible for the part you're responsible for, but the outcome is not always entirely under your influence. But if you don't do the part you're responsible for, you can know for certain the outcome won't take place. All of those things characterize work. There is a workmanlike quality to prayer. It's not a Hail Mary, hope so, last chance, last ditch effort. When nothing else works, let's try God. A meaningful prayer life is a life of consistency. It's a life of relationship. We'd like to invite you to join us for one of our weekend worship services here at World Outreach Church. You'll find lots of friendly people, engaging worship, and transformational encounters in exploring the Word of God together. There's something here for the whole family. You can choose from four service times, Saturdays at 5 and 7 p.m., Sundays at 8.30 and 10.30 a.m. Located right off of I-24, we're easy to find. You can visit our website to find our location. So join us. We'd love to see you here at World Outreach. Look in 1 Corinthians 7 and verse 31. It says, this world in its present form is passing away. New Testament's written in Greek. And there's more than one word that's used for world. The word used in this context isn't talking about this mass that's hurtling through space. It's talking about the present world order, the systems of authority that are in place on planet Earth. And it says that those systems of authority are temporary. They're not permanent. So the way we understand authority, the things that provide boundaries for life and define behavior as we witness it on planet Earth are not permanent. There's a greater power than the power that is currently in play on planet Earth. In fact, Satan is referred to as the prince of the power of the air. But his authority on planet Earth is temporary. One of the reasons there's an intensification of ungodliness as we approach the end of the age, the scripture says that Satan understands his time is short. The judgment is coming and he's going to forfeit his place of authority. So there's an intensification. He's as busy as he can be in the season he has left. In Isaiah chapter 11, we're given a window into what it will look like when Jesus returns. And there's a new authority expressed in the earth. It's not just poetic language about the sweet by and by. It's a description of life on planet Earth. It's Isaiah 11, verse 6. The wolf will live with the lamb, not as a chop. <laughs> and the leopard will lie down with the goat and the calf with the lion and the yearling together and a little child will lead them. And the cow will feed with the bear and their young will lie down together and the lion will eat straw like the ox. The infant will play near the hole of the cobra and the young child put his hand into the viper's nest. They'll neither harm nor destroy on all my holy mountain for the earth will be full of the knowledge of the Lord as the waters cover the sea. Wow. That the knowledge of the Lord will be as widespread and apparent in the earth as the oceans are today. That the way we behave will be different. The way that creation responds will be different. See, we live in a fallen world. We live in a world that's dominated by the presence of sin and carnal, fallen human beings. But there's a day coming when the, the current world order will have passed away. It's why the Bible says to us that we're in the world, but we're not of the world. It's why we're counseled to behaviors and life choices that separate us from, the, from a, a viewpoint that is completely grounded in the systems of this world. Our distinctiveness isn't because we're weird or strange. It's because we are investing in another order, another kingdom. And prayer is an important part of that. I'll give you one more example. Revelation 21. It's very near the end of your New Testament. It's the next to the last chapter in your Bible. And it's the culmination of judgment after Jesus has come back and we get just a glimpse of what is ahead. It says, I saw a new heaven and a new earth for the first heaven and the first earth had passed away and there was no longer any sea. 
And God will wipe away every tear from their eyes and there'll be no more death or mourning or crying or pain for the old order of things has passed away. No crying or pain or tears or death because that age has passed away. Sound good to you? Amen. Sound good to you? Now we're immigrants to that, folks. We've got a lot to learn and we, it'll take some humility and a desire but know this, spiritual matters matter. And we want to increasingly learn to align ourselves with the kingdom of God. Again, th this is not the, the lunatic fringe of Christianity. When Jesus taught us to pray, he said, pray this way. Our Father who's in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come. Your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. When, he's, when he told us, instructed us to pray, your kingdom come, it's, he's clearly communicating the kingdom of God has not fully arrived. And your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. How many of you think the will of God is pretty much carried out in heaven? Well, our prayer is let God's will be expressed in the earth as fully as it is in the heavens. That's our prayer. So Jesus was saying to us, the present world orders are temporary. Don't get too invested. Let your kingdom come and your will be done. We're the facilitators of that. As awkward as it seems, we're the delivery system. And all of our brokenness and inconsistency and all of the things we're trying to get alignment with and sort out, God will use us. <laughs> Room full of skeptics on a cold Sunday morning. <laughs> One other note about spiritual things. And it has to do with this unseen nature. The fact that we don't see it doesn't make it less real. God designed us uh, with five senses with which we interact with our world. We can see and hear and smell and taste and touch. And, and through those amazing tools that God's given us, we interpret the world that we live in. Not wrong, very normal. And it's an amazing set of tools. The only thing about it is those tools have limits. Your dog has better hearing than you do. He can hear things you can't hear. He has a sense of smell that exceeds your own. So the fact that you can't hear it doesn't mean there's not a noise out there or you can't smell it doesn't mean there's an odor. It means there's limit to your senses. Now this doesn't violate our, in, our intellect in many areas of our lives, but when it comes to spiritual things, we kind of bow up on this. We go, you know, I, I just don't much believe in all that spiritual mumbo jumbo stuff. You mean like God is a spirit? Or the resurrection of Jesus from the dead or the ascension back to heaven? Which one of these spiritual mumbo jumbo things are you stuck on? Because we really need to sort it out. God is a spirit. And the spiritual world is the, the fundamental reality beneath the story of Scripture. Now, I don't want you to check your brain at the door. I'm a rational creature. I'm grateful for education and learning. But there are things that my senses are not equipped to perceive that influence my life. I don't feel great this weekend. My joints are achy. My thermostat's messed up. On about a 45-minute schedule, I vacillate between freezing, and I can't stop shivering, or sweating like I'm running. It's the reason I've been avoiding most of your handshakes. I saw a doctor yesterday, just in a friendly interaction, and I, I described how I was feeling. He said, oh, sounds like you picked up a virus. I said, no, I didn't go to Walmart and buy a virus. <laughs> and I didn't drive through Mickey D's and say, I'll have an extra large virus. I'll just supersize it. In fact, I've never seen a virus. I did a, I've studied science in college and I've seen a picture of an electron microscope photograph of a virus that some geeky person said to me, that's a virus. But it just looked kind of like a little weird picture to me. I don't know. I've never seen a virus, but I have felt the effects. I said to my educated friend, he has years and years of postgraduate education. Hey, I think I got that. He looked at me like I had three heads. He said, your job, you interact with a few hundred people on a weekend. What do you mean, how'd you get it? He said, you go to the gym? I said, occasionally. He said, you pick up all those weights that everybody else touches? How'd you get it? He didn't help me a bit because he didn't help me have any idea how to not get it. 
So I thought, well, maybe all of his education is good for something. Help me how to get over it. What can I do? He said, you'll have to live this one out. I'm glad you went to school. <laughs> You're about as helpful as a screen door on a submarine. I'll call you next time. <laughs> Doesn't diminish his training. Something we can't see, something we can't knowingly hold in our hand impacts how we feel. We don't know how we got it or when it's going to go away. And we're reluctant to say spiritual things influence our lives. I don't, again, I think we're coming to it as immigrants. We're trying to learn. It's hard to believe that means something in some languages. In Tennessee, it just means back up. We're coming to it as immigrants. Let me give you one more passage and I'll quit. Luke 13 is the last one in your notes. I've been telling you that prayer matters, that when, there, when we fail to pray, we leave a door closed, that God wouldn't necessarily leave closed. He said he's given us the keys on heaven and earth to open and unlock. Prayer matters. In Luke 13, it says, on a Sabbath, Jesus was teaching in one of the synagogues and a woman was there who'd been crippled by a spirit for 18 years. He's in a synagogue on a Sabbath day. It's the equivalent of being in church on a Sunday. He's in a place of worship on the day of worship and there's a woman who for 18 years has, been, has a physical problem. The next sentence says she was bent over and couldn't straighten up at all. Now Luke, before he wrote Gospels, was a physician. And he writes with the eye of a diagnostician. Remember, he wrote this Gospel long after the events happened. So you get the benefit of hindsight. You get the benefit of the discussions he may have had with Jesus or the other disciples after the fact. The first sentence kind of sets the tale. There was a woman in this synagogue who'd been crippled by a spirit for 18 years. Now when Luke saw her, he didn't know that at first. Not on that day. He gives you the, the viewpoint he had. She was bent over and she couldn't straighten up at all. And when Jesus saw this woman who was stooped over, he called her forward and said to her, woman, you're set free from your infirmity. And he put his hands on her and he immediately she straightened up and praised God. Wow. Now what happens in the synagogue on this day if Jesus hadn't been there to pray for that woman? She's been coming for 18 years. She'd go away the way she came. I assure you in the synagogue there have been prayers every Sabbath day for 18 years. But on this day there's a difference because there was somebody with a different understanding of prayer. They brought a different kind of prayer this day. Now Jesus said you could do the same things he did. Now the Bible doesn't say that every person who's been over is been over by an unclean spirit. You, it's, it's not a fair conclusion to draw from this passage. But in this passage, that certainly seems to be the case. Her problem wasn't dominated by some physical misalignment, that whatever physical challenge she had was created by a spiritual force acting upon her. The Bible very clearly tells us that spiritual forces impact how we feel. Don't be offended by that. You believe it about a virus, why not believe it about something spiritual? It doesn't make you weird or anti-intellectual. We are learners. Now watch what happens. Indignant because Jesus had healed on the Sabbath, the synagogue ruler said to the people, there are six days for work. So come and be healed on those days, not on the Sabbath. What a happy, happy, happy man. <laughs> and the Lord answered him, you hypocrite, doesn't each of you on the Sabbath untie his ox or donkey from the stall and lead it out to give it water? Shouldn't this woman, a daughter of Abraham, whom Satan has kept bound for 18 long years, be set free on the Sabbath from what bound her? Jesus understood it wasn't just a physical problem, it was a spiritual problem. Again, not every disease has a spiritual origin but some clearly do. There's much about the healing narratives in the scripture we don't understand. Why did Jesus put mud on somebody's eye and say, go wash? Why did he go to the pools of Bethesda that was surrounded by sick people and heal one man and leave and not heal the others? There's much we don't know, but there's much we can know. Let's learn. This is such an exciting topic to work through together. When we talk about prayer, we're talking about the reality of spiritual things impacting our physical world. It takes a step of faith, a step of confidence, but it doesn't mean you have to check your brain at the door. God is capable of withstanding the scrutiny of our intellect, I promise. 
You know, I began my academic career many years ago in the basic sciences. So I'm a rational creature. I like both sides of the equation to balance. I like to know the plan at the beginning of a process. Uh, I don't want you to check your IQ or to check your rational part of you at the door, but I don't want you to lead your life only from an intellectual perspective. Spiritual things are real. Spiritual things matter. They influence your life just as much as a virus or a bacteria or any other unseen force that acts upon you. You believe in gravity, but you can't go to Walmart and buy a box. If you could, we'd buy something that was a little less forceful, perhaps. But, but spiritual things matter. And when you and I take the time to pray, when we invest ourselves in becoming a people of prayer, we make room for the power of God to be involved in our lives, to make physical changes in the world in which we live. It's a tremendous opportunity. Don't fail to pray, even if it's a single sentence. I want to pray for you before we go. Father, thank you for every person, for this time together, for the privilege of making this journey together. And I pray that you'll open our hearts and minds to your reality beyond anything we've ever imagined before. Thank you for it in Jesus' name, amen. God bless you. Join us every week for another exciting message from Pastor Alan Jackson. And until then, visit us online and discover remarkable information and resources to help take your Christian life to the next level. And when you visit online, consider joining our effort to continue sending this powerful and challenging message around the globe. We want to share this program worldwide, but we can only do it with your help. So consider partnering with us today. And if you're visiting the Nashville area, we'd love to see you at World Outreach Church in Murfreesboro. We're easy to find, so look us up when you're traveling through. And don't forget to connect with Pastor Jackson every day through social media. Thanks so much for joining us and being a part of this ministry. We'll see you again next time for another encounter with Pastor Alan Jackson.